Hello to all viewers around the world, and I hope you are well, staying safe and healthy. Today, I would like to say a very warm welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Series number 96, which is organized by the Faculty of Engineering University Technology in Malaysia. My name is Amir Zanadripur, and I am from the Institute of High Voltage and High Current School of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, UTM. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Datu Engineer Dr. Mohamed Rafiq, our Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, for great organizing this lecture. For your information, we invite prominent professors around the globe to share the knowledge, expertise, and experience, and perhaps to exchange ideas. Hence, we are indeed honored to have with us Professor Saifur Rahman from Virginia Tech, USA. Prof. Rahman will deliver the lecture with entitled the energy efficiency, the smart grid, energy internet, blockchain, IoT sensor integration today. So for those who know, Prof. Saifur Rahman is a well-known professor in the field of the renewable energy. It is my utmost pleasure as an teacher in the Distinguished Lecture Series program in December 2020. Without further delay, I will pass to Prof. Mohammad Rafid, our beloved Dean of the Faculty of Engineering to introduce said Prof. Rahman. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Amiriza. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone to our 96th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Saifur Rahman from Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute, United States of America. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Professor Saifur Rahman is the founding director of the Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech, USA, where he is the Joseph R. Loring Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He also directs the Center for Energy and the Global Environment. He is a Life Fellow of the IEEE and an IEEE Millennium Medal winner. He was the President of the IEEE Power and Energy Society for 2018 and 2019. He was the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine and the IEEE Transactions on Sustainable Energy. He has published over 150 journal papers and has made over 600 conference and invited presentations. In 2006, he served on the IEEE Board of Directors as the Vice President for Publications. He is a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society and has lectured on renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grid, energy internet, blockchain, IoT sensor integration, and so on in over 30 countries. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Saifur Rahman from, Uni from Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute, USA, with a lecture entitled Energy Efficiency in Smart Buildings Through IoT Sensor Integration. Professor Saifur Rahman. Over to you. Thank you, Prof. Rafiq, for the kind introduction. I am now briefly talk about this event. I have been to UTM many times. I know, I know UTM very well. And it's my pleasure to be invited to speak before you, even though it's online and virtual, that's fine. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. And I will be happy to answer questions at the end. So with that, very small introduction. Let me go to share my screen and start my talk. So I will going to give you this background that you are seeing now. What's going on? I mean, can you see the screen full full screen? Yes, we can see the screen, Prof. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is the title, Energy Efficiency in Smart Buildings Through IoT Sensor Integration. Few key words. I'll focus on energy efficiency, focus on smart buildings. But then the question is, how do you link energy efficiency and smart buildings? That's where IoT sensors come in. We'll show how, by using IoT sensors, you can make buildings smart and efficient. That's the idea. So let's get started. 
what is the motivation behind the research we did to bring you these results? In the US, buildings consume over 40% of total energy, not just electricity, electricity, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, all of that put together, 40% of that goes to buildings. Buildings meaning commercial buildings primarily and residential buildings. That's a very big number. On the other hand, over 90% of these commercial buildings are small size under 5,000 square feet or medium size under 50,000 square feet. So what happens, these buildings are small, therefore they cannot afford to invest a million dollar building automation system, which are available and deployed in larger hotels, multi-story commercial buildings. They don't they can afford that. So they have, they have nothing, they don't do anything. As a result, a lot of energy is wasted. So we have been talking to US Energy Department. They funded our research at Virginia Tech, develop what they call a scalable building automation system. We call it a wise building platform. My second bullet on this page. Wise building platform makes commercial buildings efficient through building automation. I'll give you more details in a second. Now, what is it? It's an open architecture platform for building energy efficiency. So is wise building is this software platform that is engineered to improve sensing and control of I all IoT enabled equipment in commercial buildings. What is an IoT equipment? Your thermostat, your light dimmer, your smart switch, your lighting controller. I'll give you examples in a few seconds. So we have, if you follow the red box in the middle on the right hand side, we are focusing on three major loads in buildings. One is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, in short, HVAC, lighting loads, plug loads, focusing on those. Our focus is to improve energy efficiency and cut down on peak load because peak load is very expensive. So I'm not going to say a whole lot more. There is a website on the upper right hand side in the yellow box called BEMcontrols.com. That company has commercialized all this work and has examples of how it is deployed and some detailed information. If you want to go there at your leisure, fine. Now, let's talk about the technology first. Our contribution has been on the, the top of the screen, this wise building platform supports multiple IoT devices through industry standard protocols and communication technologies. What do you mean by this? You know, anytime you don't talk to a smart device, you must have a protocol. Is it a Zigbee device, Wi-Fi device, serial interface, many things come in. So we are a university. We do not have any hardware that we build. We buy hardware commercially and make them work. So what we have done here, this experiment, this is my lab setup, in fact. I can go floor by floor. In my case, I go to one floor of a six-story building, like on the left-hand side, and you put multiple thermostats of different kind, Wi-Fi, uh, Zigbee, smart energy profile, different kinds of thermostats. Then you have VAV controller, which controls the opening of the vent to let more cool air come out or hot air come out. There is a Modbus protocol. So Modbus protocol, then if you go to the right-hand side, so leave from left, RTU Modbus, Philip Hue Wi-Fi, Light Switch Wi-Fi, Lighting Load Controller, Backnet, all those names may not be familiar to you, but those are protocols used by vendors, manufacturers, to communicate with their device. Got a ballast, smart plug, uh, plug load controller, occupancy sensor, light sensor, power meter, and different kinds of power meters. What we did, we developed our software platform on a very low cost, small platform because it can be used by one grocery store, one shop, one pharmacy, one library. So what we did in this box you see in the middle, that box contains a Raspberry Pi, which many of you know, that's a very small computer. 
with Wi-Fi capability. That's the brain of the system. On the left-hand side, I have an iPad because I need an I.O., right, input-output device to send signals. That's the I iPad. So that's it. That's the setup. So what happens here, because it is scalable, I put this for one floor and see if it works, then replicate the same thing on the floor number two, floor three, up to floor six, and that's done. Then the whole building is under control. However, you can tell as I bring more and more devices, this Raspberry Pi device begins to be overloaded. So you have to go to a bigger computer or go to the cloud. And I'll tell you what we did to make it scalable into many buildings. Now, this is important. We call it multiple protocol interoperability, meaning we must be smart enough to accept anybody's device, regardless of the protocol, but we cannot say this device cannot be used because we cannot support that protocol. We cannot say that. That is why we have done the research and developed our platform to follow all these COM technologies or data exchange protocols like Ethernet, Serial, ZigBee, Wi-Fi, BACnet, Modbus, Web, like XML, ZigBee API, Smart Energy Profile, OpenIDL. All those are possible. On the right-hand side, you see the, those logos. This is, this is how you see them. The IEEE 802.3, for example, 802.11, those are standards. So we can deal with all of those. That's how our software is versatile. Now, we are talking about one building I saw before, now multiple buildings. Now, we have to move to the cloud. What you are showing here, this could be UTM campus, many buildings. Each building has heating, ventilation, AC, thermostat, lighting load, plug load, sensor or power meters, water meters, rooftop PV or ground-mounted PV storage, and security camera. All of those can and do exist in every building in our, platform, in our portfolio. Each building, now, because of so many things have to be controlled, we gave up the Raspberry Pi idea and went to the cloud. In our software, this wise building platform resides in the atmosphere, I mean, in the Amazon cloud. Each building has an account in the Amazon cloud. You can see here, each building has an account. So we get six buildings, six accounts. Simultaneously, there is typically on a campus a department of facilities that manage all these buildings. So a facilities department manager has a super user access. So he or she can look at each building's cloud platform to see what's happening in every building and send commands anytime. On the left-hand side, I'm connected to the power company's cloud as well because to run a smart building, you must know the variable power pricing at different times of the day. That information comes from the power company's computer. Hook to that. So that's what's happening in this picture. And this is how we do many things. We're focusing on occupant comfort, heating, cooling, ventilation, humidity, demand response. We can focus on solar PV storage, energy savings, building energy management, peak load reduction, alarm notifications, security surveillance. All of that is now done by this wise building platform, which is now commercially available through BM controls. Now, so what is this summary then? We claim, or we can claim that wise building platform can make any old building smart. Why is that important? Typically, if you are looking at your UTM campus, any campus for that matter, you have many large buildings. When the buildings are designed, they look into the building automation system, which will go into that building. As the building construction starts, they start wiring for the building automation system to be deployed in that building. It is done while the building is under construction so that you don't tear up the wall after the building is ready. We call it SCADA system, data acquisition system. That's set up, it's common practice. But then, as you see in the US case, 90% of the buildings here are more than 10, 15 years old. Small buildings. They were not designed 
to run a building automation system. They're designed that way. So they have no wiring. Does it mean we shut them off? No. We have said in our solutions, all stick in wireless systems. It doesn't matter what the room you do, all buildings can take it because the wireless does not need any wiring to be done. Some devices are not wireless devices like BACnet Modbus protocol. We put that in, then we have an IP converter. We convert the analog signal to IP, which is now wireless. That's how we did that. Did that. That, is, that my point is, because of that flexibility, we can go to any building regardless and make it smart building. So what are the other protocol savings we experienced? We have deployed in many buildings. We typically see 20% savings from heating and cooling applications, mainly cooling in Malaysia in your case, maybe more than 20%. And lighting savings is 25% or more. I'll give you some data in a few minutes. The savings. What we have seen, we can generate other benefits from our wise building or smart building platform. What are the other benefits? Listen carefully. We are monitoring the air conditioner, the light, the smart plug, the camera, the rooftop solar, the battery storage in almost real time. You can measure every 10 seconds what's going on. Then think about this. You have a rooftop air conditioner, typically the case. You know, the roof, it works fine, nobody cares. One day, it's no, heat, no cooling is happening because something broke in that air conditioner. It happens once in a while. Then you send the technician to the roof. He goes in there and says, yes, the bearing broke and the motor seized, stopped. So what do you do? You look at that, order parts. Parts take three, four days to come in. And then after two days, it's working back again. So three plus two, five days, one week is gone. That means you suffered for a week because you had no early warning that the, that the rooftop air conditioning bearing is going to break. What is the difference here? Look at this. Since I monitor every five seconds, every 10 seconds, the current draw for each of those devices on the roof, so that air conditioner number six, for example, is monitored in real time. So we have alarm systems. What happens? If that air conditioner is drawing more current than normal, it's possible, why does, does it happen? If you have a friction, more friction, or the shaft is stuck because of the dirt in the bearing or something got caught, it will try to pull more current because of the friction, it needs more torque to run the motor. Now begin to see the current draws 25% more, 30% more. That's an early warning signal. Then you tell the building engineer, we are, or he will see it in fact on his screen that building number 16, Rooftop unit number six is pulling more current. It's early warning. He comes into the roof, says, yes, the bearing is tight. He can stop it, clean the bearing, goes back to normal. So you don't have to wait for it to break. That's the call improved ONM system. That's one. Second benefit besides energy savings and peak savings, occupant satisfaction. Since we are able to put many sensors on any floor, we can monitor the temperature reading in a granular fashion, not one thermostat per, a big, per big floor, okay, many thermostats. What typically happens in a building, either too cold or too hot, because if you AC running too much, it's too cold, not running enough, it's not cold enough. Because we can monitor location-wise what's happening, temperature portfolio, we can adjust the heating and cooling based on the user preference on that floor. That's what I mean by occupant satisfaction. Moreover, we can also monitor the CO2 concentration, PM 2.5, and maybe someday COVID uh, SARS uh, virus concentration. And based on that information, we can make adjustments to the airflow, make the air in, this, uh, in the building more healthy. Those are the other benefits. Now, some examples. I'm going to talk about four buildings here. We have deployed in many, on many buildings. So Virginia, Washington, Maryland, different locations. For it doesn't matter, but point is, these are normal buildings, like a classroom building, garage, 
library, retail store, uh, day, I mean, uh, senior center, all of these, fine. This building, our classroom building at Virginia Tech is fairly old. It's built in 1947, the 70-plus year old building. Normal building, classroom says fine, building size 20,000 square feet, energy consumption per month, electricity that is, 14 to 25 megawatt hour per month, summertime more because of air conditioning. The building is heated using, using gas, so the no electricity to heat the building. That's why the number is low in winter time. Anyway, that's a building. Now we deployed our solution called BMOS or BOS building in that building. What do we, it's a classroom now, by the way. We have many sensors in the classroom. We get all the wireless, so no need to do any wiring and, 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 and drawing uh, wires. This sensor on the top monitors carbon dioxide, noise, temperature, and relative humidity. On machine, does all of that. That sends the signal to this box on, in the middle right-hand side, it'll be more score. That core is a Raspberry Pi, literally. Receives that wireless signal for CO2, noise, temperature, relative humidity, and holds there. At the bottom, I have a plug load controller. That is also sending wireless signal to the Raspberry Pi. On the left-hand side, I have a motion sensor so that I can dim the light or not cool the room so much when nobody's there. I have a thermostat on the left-hand side, smart thermostat, which is wireless. It controls the operation of the rooftop unit on the upper left. There's a setup, very simple. So why do I need a smart plug? This room has LCD projector, printer, a computer. When the classes are going on, we use them. But then at nine, nine o'clock at night, class over, people go home, people forget on those things. So they just forget. They stay all night, all weekend. Now, because of the smart plug, which we can program, we can program to turn things off after 9.30 p.m. or whatever it is. That's the benefits. And this is a setup, by the way. Now, what happened? This is screenshot from an iPad for that system in that classroom. So we are looking at the indoor environment, temperature in Fahrenheit, by the way, humidity, pressure, CO2 concentration in the middle, and noise in that classroom, real time, always. We also monitor outdoor conditions, temperature, and humidity. If you look at this blue box, it's a plot of the CO2 concentration in that classroom. Notice, by the way, room has no windows. So ambient about 450 or so today. So during the, most of the day, nobody in the classroom goes to about 600 or so. As by 6.30, 7 o'clock, people or students begin to come to the classroom. The concentration of CO2 begins to rise. As they sit in the room, they breathe and they talk, it goes up to 1,100 parts per million. It's very high, uncomfortable. If any time in an enclosed environment, the concentration goes over 750 parts per million, you begin to feel uncomfortable. How do you solve this problem? When the sensor that I showed you, this sensor on the upper right, senses the level of CO2 exceeding 750 parts per million, it will throw more fresh air from the ceiling automatically. It throws more fresh air, it dilutes the CO2, and you feel comfortable. That's another benefit. It's not cooling or heating or ventilation. Very different, right? CO2 control. That's an example of what we can do with this open architecture platform. Now, this is one building. Now talk about energy and peak load for the same floor in that classroom building. Again, on the upper left-hand side, my equipment, I put six thermostats, two per floor to see what's going on, six power meters, because I have six rooftop air conditioners, it's the people peep picture on the top in the middle, the rooftop air conditioners. I put one lithium ion battery to see the peak load reduction and one sensor for the environment, which you saw before. So base case, we're doing this research for a number of years now. On the left-hand side, I see before we deployed the wise building platform to control and monitor the system in that building, Data for by the one floor only, only one floor. 
So for three months in the summer, June, July, August, in one year, summertime, that, that floor consumed 8,340 kilowatt hour. That floor only, fine. Once you deployed the control system, which is why it's building, the consumption for the three months ne next year came down to 6,000 kilowatt hour. That gives you a 26.8% savings in energy. Fine. See what happens in real time. The center part of the screen I'm looking here, here now, two gray boxes, one on the top, one on the bottom, that shows you the plot for three things. The green line represents the room temperature. Fine. The blue line represents the consumption of electricity by the air conditioner for that floor. Red line is the thermostat set point. I set that to 74. Four degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees centigrade. The set point. You see here normal operation on the, on the middle of the picture. Normal operation as the green line shows temperature creeps up, it exceeds the set point. AC comes on. The AC comes on, the power consumption for the AC goes to about three kilowatts and then runs for a few minutes. Temperature begins to drop because room is cooler now. As the temperature going down exceeds, I mean, as on the way down, it goes beyond or goes below the thresh threshold, AC turned off. You can see the blue line is low. It is at the bottom of the screen. It is flat. There's some load because there are lights on the floor and the fan sometimes run to keep the ventilation going. That's for low consumption. Again, after a few minutes, the room gets hot again, exceeds the 74 or 22 degree centigrade, AC comes on. That goes on every day, <clears throat> all day. I'm showing you data from 12 noon to 5 p.m. On the right-hand side, what we did, we said, let's see if we can manage that classroom or that floor without turning the AC for four hours because that is the time 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., most, most expensive electricity. If you can avoid using the air conditioner for four hours, you can save money. So we let the AC turn off. However, we figured out if we just turn the AC off at 1 p.m., maybe by 4 p.m. it'll get too hot, more than 25 degrees C, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. 25 degrees C is more hotter than people can people like, would not want. What it did in a clever way, we said, okay, let's see. Since the electricity price is not high before one o'clock, let's pre-cool that room, pre-cool. We started cooling at 12 noon, even though it is not hot to bring in the air conditioner. We cool it anyway. If you cool it, bring it, bring it to 20 degrees centigrade, and then turn the AC compressor off. Turn it off, it slowly begins to raise the temperature. In our case, we saw at five o'clock or five o'clock or so, the temperature has reached 25 degrees C, but that time uh, my control ends anyway, I can bring the AC back. What's the net benefit? Before I did the control, our set point was 74, 22 degrees C, energy usage in four hours, 2.7 kilowatt hour, peak demand was about four kilowatt without control. When I did the control, the yellow box on the lower right hand side, I raised the temperature set point from 22 to 25 degrees C, and I see the energy usage drops to 1.4 from 2.7, almost 50% drop. And bigger impact is this. Demand was 3.98, became only 0.5 because AC compressor did not come on. Did that 5.5 kW for the fan and the light. That's the benefit. That's one example. Let's look at different example. Different building in Virginia. This is a garage for repair for school buses, the bottom floor. Upper floor is the office room for that same building. This office room has multiple functions. In the middle of the picture here, you see the work area or the storage area, which has a skylight. Skylight as well as ceiling lights, which are LED lights. I go to the place to, to see what's going on. I see a lot of light coming from the skylight. At the same time, the lights in the ceiling are also running full capacity. I said, you don't need that many lights. 
So why keep it on? They have those lights, you see one, two, three, four, seven, seven lights here are only on switch. So you cannot turn them partially off, either all of them off or none of them off. So they keep it on. The one solution would be as the solar light intensity grows as the day progresses, can you dim the lights equivalently so that your total amount of light is the same? The light is a sum of two sources from the skylight and the ceiling light. I put a light sensor on the wall between the door and the window, and that measures the light intensity. The intensity goes up because sunlight is stronger. It will dim the light automatically. That's how we saved it. That's one. Second example on the upper right-hand side, the staff working area. They're all allowed to lunch right now. When they go to lunch, they do not turn the lights off because light is only one switch. So let's keep it on. The picture below is a conference room. Again, nobody in the conference room, the lights are on. We say we'll put some dimming switches. That's it. Dimming switches will have two protocols, one scheduling and one dimming level. So like here, lunchtime, they are not here. We know when they go to lunch, 12 noon and 1 p.m., we will dim lights to some extent. You can see people, you can work, but you cannot read a book, maybe. That's the difference. So that's what you did. As a result of this dimming control, we were able to save, on the average, about 34.5% energy just by dimming and scheduling, that example there. So this is a summary for three months worth of data. The middle column in this page, on this page, October, November, December, October consumption without any dimming, 399.9, 400 kilowatt hour, November 423, December 426. Once you apply dimming, the column to the left, 399.9 became 264.37, 423 became 278, 426 became 280. So as a result, you got 34% savings. That's the number. Question you might ask, how do I know how to dim? That's a good question. We can use machine learning, which will monitor the activities of the people working on that floor when they come to work, when they go to lunch, when they have conferences, all that you have done. And by that, you can see at the bottom of my screen some text, like we are doing controlling 6.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. After that, nobody is there, so we don't care. So office area A, dim 50%. Office area B, 45%. Chief desk area, 60%. Those numbers came from our analysis of the usage pattern for this flow. And that's how we got one third energy savings. Good. Different example. As I said, this is an open architecture platform that can monitor and control many different things besides heating, cooling, and lighting. In my building at Virginia Tech, we have rooftop solar. So I'm monitoring the operation of the rooftop solar, temperature, solar radiation, PV output, wind speed, and many other things, like you see here. Again, a screenshot for that solar rooftop unit in my building. So I have incident radiation, DC wattage, AC wattage, panel efficiency, inverter efficiency, total efficiency, uh, voltage DCAC, current DCAC, energy produced, uh, array radiation, ambient temperature, module temperature, wind speed. All of that is done. Same platform for building automation. It is doing different function. Point is because it is an open architecture platform. You can do many things with it. OK, now different example again. Storage battery. The building I showed you some time back, that building 73 years old, we put a battery storage in that building to see if we can reduce the peak consumption during peak hours by discharging the battery, which was charged the night before, so that we can pay less bill because we pay a very high price for peaking capacity. This is the battery setup. People ask me that question. Put a battery, it takes space. It does. We hung it on the wall. It did not use up any floor space 
in that building, as simple as that. It works fine. This is a screen capture for the battery storage module on my wise building platform. Tells you the current status, the state of charge, output power, all that data is on your fingertips. So this is the last second to last slide. This is a screen capture from this website called our company called bmcontrols.com. So they say because of this wise building and BM control portfolio, we can make any building smart. So you can do, you can build your own building automation system using this protocol and some hardware, which you can buy in Malaysia, I'm sure. I've seen those in Singapore. Uh, good thing is you can be in one location, many buildings. You can monitor in real time what is the status of current voltage, power, noise, humidity, CO2 for any building you want to. As a result, we can make the building more efficient and a better place to work. So with that, I'm done. My last slide. Again, my, my email address is here. I know there will be questions today, which I'll try to answer. If I'm not able to answer because time ran out, just send me an email. I'll try to respond verbally. Now let me talk about IEEE. IEEE is a big organization, over 400,000 members globally. Malaysia has close to 2,000 members of IEEE, 2,000, big number. IEEE does many things. It's a big publisher. We publish about 150 journals and magazines, like a publisher. We're a big conference host. We, every year, organize more than 2,000 conferences globally, 2,000. Many in Malaysia. I've seen many, I've done conference Malaysia myself. Also, we're big in standards. IEEE standards organization, like the I told you, the IEEE 802.11. That's your Wi-Fi standard, the IEEE standard. Many things. Because IEEE is so big, it has to have a lot of volunteers and volunteer leaders. So IEEE does an election every year to select volunteers, of course, right? It's a open organization. You choose people by voting. So this is the website for voting, IEEE.org slash petition. If you go there, you'll see names of many candidates. And you can vote for any of them, all of them, <laughs> up to you. So then you have, you can say, I have played a role in choosing the next leader of IEEE. The presidents are elected every year. We elect, a main, we elect IEEE president, society president, standards president, many things happen. So just go to the web location, IEEE.org slash petition. You'll see names of candidates running for, running for uh, IEEE positions. Vote. So with that, let me stop here. I stop sharing and ready for questions. So thank you so much, Professor Sefor Rahman, for your informative uh, lecture and very interesting talk. Let me inform all viewers from Malaysia and around the world, you are welcome to post any relevant question here. If you have any question, you can post uh, it to Prof. Rahman. And I will read the question from the Facebook comment for Prof. Rahman. For starting the section, uh, I want to ask one question from me first. Uh, Prof, actually, we bought uh, a greenhouse at the UTM campus, and uh, the electricity can support it by the photovoltaic system. Uh, I want to know uh, how the blockchain can help to improve the energy efficiency. Blockchain? Yeah. Yeah, blockchain is a database where you can bring information without compromise. That's important, without compromise. Mm -hmm. Once the data enters a blockchain, it can, cannot be changed by anybody. That we call immutable. So if you have a greenhouse, you're monitoring the greenhouse temperature, humidity, maybe CO2 concentration, light intensity, all of those. So if you are getting that information, if you pass through a blockchain platform, and they're available now commercially, IBM has one, Microsoft has one, Google has one, then the data is secure. And you can send the data to many people to do studies and do research, but data is now 
perfectly clean. So blockchain is a database which will allow you to store and use data without being compromised. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, let me to check, receive any question or not. Okay, not to see any question. Maybe have a lot of questions after uh, this section. And uh, if anybody interested to see the lecture uh, later, can see the Facebook page of the Faculty of Engineering University Technology in Malaysia. So thank you so much, Prof. I think due to limited time, we have to finish this lecture. And uh, if the reviewer have more questions, can just email later. I believe the Prof. Rahman is uh, happy to answer all questions. Let me uh, inform uh, you the program is not available to closing this section. There's a question uh, here. There's a question on the screen from um, um, Pauzi okay. Abdullah has a question. Now receive one question here. Can you read, Prof? Yeah, I can read it. You can read it. May I know the size of the battery you installed? How much is the cost? <laughs> okay, battery size is five. Let me hold on a second. Battery size is five kilowatt. 12 kilowatt hour battery size. And you can buy these batteries uh, from Tesla battery, for example, in Malaysia. And battery cost is now about, it's a 12 kilowatt hour battery, will cost you today about $5,000 US in that range. So that's the price, but that price is coming down significantly. If you want to go pausey down the road on, you go to Tesla website, they call Powerwall. Those comes in module of five, eight, 12 kilowatt hour size. So that's what we have used. Any other question? Thank you so much. Let me receive any other question or not. Maybe they're thinking. So, so the, the the point is, you have a campus, UTM. Many other countries have campus like this. So I'd like you to think about the possibility of looking at your campus setup and see how you can make take a building, take a floor of a building. What I suggested here could be a class project, could be a thesis project. As a, as a professor, I am very interested to see idea is used up. So I will suggest we have a website called BMOS. Uh, I'm going to write it down again. And if you see it, uh, I'll raise it. I'm going to put it in there. That's the website, BEMOSS.org. If you go there, you can download the software package. It's there, free open source. It has some of my technical papers, <coughs> which explains how it is done. So I would strongly advise you to go there, download it. It's a sample program, sample devices that you can play with and see what happens. A good, good experiment for, for uh, engineering students. Yeah, that's good. Well, uh, let me know what is the name of the software, Prof? I mean, I, I, can you see my chat box? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. I put it there, B-E-M-O-S-S dot O-R-G. OK, thank you so much. OK. So if yes. no more questions, OK, one more question. Yeah, yeah. Receive one more question here. <laughs> That's a good question. Does the pandemic situation change human behavior with regards to energy usage? You know, globally, <laughs> Use of energy has gone down because we don't go to office. I don't as much. So offices are not running at much air conditioning anymore or heating anymore. Uh, people are driving less for sure. So less gasoline is being consumed. People are not going to restaurants. So you're not cooking as much food. So that's, yes, overall it has gone down some, but it will come back, I'm sure, as we come out of this COVID pandemic. Thank 
you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank uh, you. Due to the time, we have to closing uh, this section. Let me to inform you, the Prof. Rafiq is not available to closing uh, this section. And uh, he has a meeting now. I have to close this section and thanks audience. And uh, I hope to see the Prof. Rahman in UTM again and keep the collaboration with the regional tech in the future. Thank you so much and bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.